Good morning, everyone, and thank you for coming to the talk. Uh, my name is Bob Stiegel, and I'm here to talk about some ideas for improving the containers in C++ 2x. It's probably too late for it to be C++ 20, but maybe 23, maybe not. Um, unlike the other two talks that I've given here, these, this is going to be a relatively short talk. There are not a whole lot of slides. There are some ideas that I'd like to put out to the audience to think about, to chew on, uh, in the context of improving fundamental aspects of the designs of the containers. There's not a lot of, there's very little source code. I don't have all the benchmarks and graphs that I've had before. Uh, instead, I just like to talk at a high level. And uh, you could have the side of the, the, the happy uh, benefit that it won't be a very long talk and we can all be first in line for the morning refreshments. Uh, so, in thinking about it, uh, I submitted this talk and I had the word proposal in there. And I came to regret that later because I realized that, you know, this sort of has the connotation that I've got some paper ready to rock and roll and, and hand to LEWG, and that's not the case at all. So I'm going to, uh, by fiat, uh, unilaterally change the name to some thoughts on improving the containers. Uh, and uh, maybe if I'm lucky, I will gain some co-conspirators to help me with a paper. Uh, and also, I will say, as yesterday, uh, this is sponsored by the American East Const Association of America. <laughs> and uh, I am wearing my green uh, identifier. Okay. Cognitive dissonance. From Wikipedia, in the field of psychology, cognitive dissonance is the mental discomfort or psychological stress experienced by a person who simultaneously holds two or more contradictory beliefs, ideas, or values. To wit, <laughs> I love the standard containers. I hate the standard containers. <laughs> I expect that many of us in the room have had that same experience. So, goals for this talk. As I said, I think it's probably going to be a short talk, and I apologize if anyone feels shortchanged by that. I would like to present some thoughts and some ideas. And yesterday when I spoke about uh, fancy pointers, I did a little bit of pontificating at the end, and that experiment seemed to go over very well, so I'm probably going to do a little bit of that here. I would really like to provoke some discussion, whether it's in this session, or amongst yourselves, or with me outside of this session, but I would like to provoke discussion about how the containers are implemented and designed and the interfaces that they provide, and especially discussion around the idea of trying to better understand what our users' expectations and requirements are, and not just assume that the interface and the tools that have been provided for the last 24 years are the best ones today. I just like to step back from the trees and take a look at the forest, so to speak. Uh, as I said earlier, if people are interested in this effort, if I think that there's consensus that maybe this idea that I have is worth pursuing, uh, maybe, I can, uh, maybe I can win some supporters to the cause who might be interested in, in working on this a little more. And finally, uh, since there's no screen up here protecting me from beer bottles, uh, I would like to escape the room relatively unharmed. Uh, my wife says that my earning potential exceeds the value of my life insurance policy, so she wants me to come home. <laughs> All right. Uh, so, a real quick history on the containers. In 79, Alexander Stepanov begins working on his uh, ideas around uh, generic programming. Uh, he was at General Electric, I recall, at the time, and there were really no compilers that he could use to implement his ideas. Uh, later in 1983, ADA uh, became the first language that provided some form of generic programming support, followed by Eiffel in 1985. Uh, and I have never written code in Eiffel or Ada, so I can't speak to the veracity of this claim. Uh, but once Ada became available, 
uh, Mr. Stepanov and another gentleman named David Musser collaborated and published an Ada library in 1987 for generic list processing. Uh, now, Ada was a, a DOD language and really was only used inside defense applications and never really made it big in the outside world. And, I, and from what I've read, uh, Dr. Stepanov became dissatisfied with it and started looking for other languages uh, that he could, in which he could work to better express his ideas. Uh, sometime, I believe, in the late 90s or late 80s or early 90s, uh, Dr. Stepanov was at HP Research Labs. And he and his team were experimenting with C and C++. Uh, C, C was relatively mature at the time, and C++ was relatively immature. The idea of templates were very, very new at the time. And he was also joined by Meng Li, uh, who actually made quite large contributions to the initial design. In fact, somewhere at, at, in my house, I have a 24-year-old printed uh, document stapled together of the original description of the STL, and it's entitled The Standard Te Template Library, uh, HP Research Labs, Alexander Stepanov, and Meng Li. And unfortunately, I think Meng Li's contribution tends to get lost in the mists of history. Uh, one, I think, very interesting thing about this is, uh, from what I've read, Dr. Stepanov became interested in C and C++ because of pointers, of all things. The, the C++ abstract machine and the availability of pointers uh, provided a way of, of working with variables and accessing memory directly in a way that uh, provided the performance benefits that he was looking for at the time. So somewhere in this time frame, apparently, according to the history books, between 1992 and 1993, Andrew Koenig who was a very active member of the committee at that time and, and very influential in the early development of C++ and I believe was also at Bell Labs, somehow he found out about this work at HP Research Labs and contacted Dr. Stepanov and convinced him, hey, you've got a really good thing here. You should go to a committee meeting and present it. And again, according to the history books, in November of 1993, uh, Stepanov went to a committee meeting and, and, uh, and presented his ideas. Uh, and apparently the ideas were met with very positive response. And they asked him and uh, Meng Li uh, to provide a proposal for the subsequent March committee meeting. And uh, so they had, you know, four months, lots of time uh, to take their original ideas and put them into a standard ease-like draft to propose to the committee. Well, they did that and the committee said, oh, we like it, as the committee always does, but you need to do more. Uh, and so they presented again at the July meeting and that proposal was accepted. Uh, later in the summer, HP, in an unexpected act of, of generosity, uh, made the STL publicly available. And I can remember downloading it on my son workstation with FTP from, you know, something.hp.com. Uh, in the following years, before the first standard, uh, there was lots of additional work that was done, including uh, adding the associative containers and what I think of as the STLification of other pieces of the library, like the I.O. streams uh, and strings, the, the two that come to mind immediately. And of course, we all know in 1998, the very first version of the standard was published in September of that year. In 2003, there was the first update with some bug fixes and minor changes. As far as containers are, going, uh, are concerned, uh, in 2007, there was the official establishment of the TR1 namespace, which included some new containers and array and the unordered containers. And finally, in 2011, C++11 was born, and those new containers were moved into the STUD namespace, and now we all use them and think of them today as just being part of life. So I'd like to make a, a few comments on what I see as being uh, the brilliance of the STL. I think it really brings four important things to the, to the table. Speed. It's very highly optimized. Uh, it's, it's hard to do better 
than the standard algorithms unless you're really working hard or you're doing something very specialized. Uh, efficiency. And here I mean not only efficiency in terms of time efficiency, but also spatial efficiency and saving memory. There are lots of tricks that the standard library implementers use uh, to squeeze extra space out of things, to, to get rid of unused wastage, wasted space, and make things smaller, if at all possible. Extensibility. You know, if you have some type that meets the standard specified requirements for a random access iterator, you can use it with std sort. That's brilliant. You can add things that work with the library without them being part of the library. You can create new containers that express iterators that you can use the standard algorithms with. And, and you can have those containers interact with the standard containers. I mean, this kind of extensibility, you know, I'm not a, an expert on lots of languages, but I can't really think of any language that gives you that kind of power with the same combination of efficiency and speed that you get with the STL. There's really nothing between the STL and the silicon. And finally, the elegance of the design. I mean, it's, it's brilliant. You know, Nicholas Wirth said that programs are data structures and algorithms. Uh, and that's what STL is, and it ties them together. It connects them with the ideas of iterators. And if you think about it, there are only five iterator categories, but you know, they are sufficient to do 99.99% .99 of everything that we would like to do on a daily basis in regular production code. The library has been so successful that these underlying ideas have become embedded in our way of thinking as C++ programmers. They're just, you know, they're part of us now. And sometimes it's kind of hard to think of things in other ways. So given all of these great things that are available in the containers and the algorithms, how do we make improvements to it, right? It's, it's kind, of, uh, kind of arrogant for me to stand up here and say, hey, I can make it better. I'm not sure that I really can. I have some ideas, and that's what I'd like to talk about. So, Pontificating for a moment. In, in writing software and thinking about this, you know, there are a few guiding principles that I like to think that I follow. One, and probably the most important, important one really, people pay us to write code that's correct, right? They don't like problems, they don't like bugs. This is how the businesses that we work for make their money. We have to write correct code. That's probably job number one. Those same businesses that pay our salaries also like us to have fast code so they spend less money on the resources necessary to generate the correct results that they pay us for. So performance is probably number two. Uh, performance without correctness is usually not valuable in a business sense, uh, certain companies notwithstanding. <laughs> uh, conceptual integrity. You know, this is an idea from Fred Brooks's seminal book, The Mythical Man Month, uh, published in 1975. And the idea behind conceptual co integrity is if you stand back and look at the design, you can see that it makes sense as a whole. It has exactly what it needs and no more. All of the pieces fit together in an elegant way. Now, I can't define elegance. Uh, I sort of know it when I see it. So it's a, it's. You know, it's sort of an artistic thing. Mnemonic integrity. This is a Bob term. And getting to one of my pet peeves with libraries. Mnemonic integrity is an idea that I think of as being closely related to conceptual integrity. And mnemonic integrity is, if I learn how to use the interface in one part of the system, not the, I'm not talking about the system and the design of the system. I'm talking about the interface that I, that I employ to use the system. I don't want it to be a patchwork of ideas. If I learn one section of interface, I want it to work in other places the same way. I only want to learn one thing. You know, my L1, L2, and L3 caches are shrinking every year, and I don't like to have them full of things that I don't really need. Readability. 
I think readability is important in source code because readability is a necessary condition for understandability. Uh, and in my opinion, pontificating here, the lack of attention to these last four items is what leads to technical debt in our, in our code. If you try to do a good job promoting these ideas, I, I contend that the technical debt in your code will be reduced. It won't be eliminated, but it could be very well be reduced. Okay, off the soapbox. What specifically do I think could be improved? The container names. Uh, I have two degrees in physics, uh, a bachelor's and a master's from Case Western Reserve University, and I hate the name Vector. I hate it with a passion. A vector is a mathematical object that denotes a direction and has magnitude. This is a travesty, an atrocity. Uh, list. That's kind of meaningless to me. What is list? Is it a singly linked list? Is it a doubly linked list? Is it some other data structure? I understand that these names were chosen when compilers had limited amounts of memory and the links of names actually had, a, were a factor in the performance of, of, at compile time. So I get it, but I think we can do better. We should do better. Container selection. Uh, there are a heck of a lot more containers I think that the standard library should provide and I'm going to give you a list of them uh, because I'm standing up here and you're sitting down there. Public APIs. I have a few pet peeves about the public APIs that containers express. I am very much in agreement with John Kaub on the naming of predicates. Empty. Is it a verb? Is it an adjective? Why don't we call it is empty? We have a whole boatload of traits, is this, is that. Why can't we have is empty? Or why can't we have the converse? Has elements, right? Readability. I would like to see something like if, parentheses, container, my container is C, if, parentheses, C dot, is empty, close parens, do something. I don't want to look at empty and say, well, what does that really mean? The thing that everybody loves to hate, allocators. I'm one of those rare people that actually is kind of interested in them. Uh, there's a common, I think, and correctly held belief that uh, the containers suffer from type pollution, right? The type of the allocator is part of the template signature of all the containers, and it pollutes the container. It adds noise that is unnecessary. I'm going to show a design, a sketch of a design that I think and I hope will convince you that uh, you know, we, could, uh, uh, we could eliminate that noise. We could remove that pollution. There are lots of various minor nits that I have. I'm not going to talk about those today. Those are little things that can be dealt with later. I would like to step back and, and think more about slightly larger issues in container design rather than specific quibbles that I have with the names of member functions. The underlying implementations of the containers, and this is another big pet peeve that I have, the, the conflation of concrete containers and abstract adapters. A map should not be a container. A map should be an adapter that wraps some other underlying concrete, concrete container. All the major implementations treat it that way. I mean, they all have a red-black tree under the hood, and the map is something that wraps the red-black tree. Well, that red-black tree is the concrete container, and the map is the abstract adapter. And oh, by the way, I would sure like to have a red-black tree without fooling around with map or set. Understandability. I think it would be nice if we were able to write source code that appeared in our standard library implementations that a relatively unsophisticated user could step through in a debugger and understand what's going on, or at least build some picture. It is crazy talk. Uh, oh, by the way, the comment is, it's crazy talk. Oh, wait, you're trying to do me out of a job. That's what you're trying to do. 
Marshall, I am deeply sorry that I'm trying to put you out of a job. <laughs> Understandability. Understandability leads to better code. It leads to reduced maintenance. At the end of the day, understandability puts money on the bottom line. The businesses that pay us to work for them want more money on their bottom line. So let's think about understandability because it contributes to that. Think about the time in the past that you've wasted looking at some piece of the code trying to figure out what the heck is this thing doing? You know, is this a quick sort? You think it's a quick sort, but well, maybe it's not a quick sort because it doesn't act like a quick sort, but there's no documentation. It's cryptically written. Uh, it's 10 years old and it's been touched by five people. It's ununderstandable and it's wasting money. It's wasting your employer's money. It's wasting your time. It's wasting precious seconds out of your life that you could spend doing more interesting things like listening to me. <laughs> so I want to step back and, and talk a little bit about requirements. Now, you know, I've worked in a couple large companies. I've worked in small companies. I ran a fairly successful small company that made medical imaging software. Uh, I've worked for myself. Uh, in the past. And especially today, I sort of see three broad categories of users, and each category brings different expectations to the table. And I don't mean any insult or harm to these names. I tried to pick names that were reflective of their expectations and experience levels and not be diminutive in any way. So casual users. Especially in the environment that I'm working in today, there are lots of programmers, there are 10 programmers on my team, and a lot of them are actually, uh, about half of them are actually mostly Java programmers, but our, our application has got a fair amount of Java, and slightly more than half of it is C++, and so they switch back and forth all the time, but they're not very sophisticated C++ users. They are what I would call casual users. I mean, they're actually working in several different languages. So when they slip into C++ and they have to get something done, they want maximum ease of use. They want a minimum learning curve. They want a good experience. And they want to be productive right out of the box. They want it simple. And in a sense, I think, you know, given my limited knowledge of the topic, it seems like that kind of simplicity is something, and I hate to say this, that Java generics express. And I, maybe I'll have them bleep that out of the tape. And power users are more sophisticated users. These are the people I think of. They're doing mostly C++ most of the time. So they want that ease of use, but they also want some customizability in how they use the containers because they're probably going to be looking at one point or another for higher performance. Not the highest performance, but higher performance or some customized customization <laughs> that your casual users are not going to care about. Finally, there are the expert users, like everybody in this room, who want maximum customizability because they're trying to solve very highly specialized problems and, and or they are seeking the highest possible performance in, uh, for their application. I contend that the containers should provide levels of interface that are appropriate to each of those sets of expectations. And I'm going to show you, as I said, a sketch of a design that I think may meet this in some way. My other pet peeve, meaningful names. For God's sake, can we just call things what they are? A rose by any other name does not smell as sweet in software engineering, and I think that names are important. I think they're important because well-chosen names provide context. They help me understand what something is uh, in, in the context of the problem I'm solving. They can denote relationships between the thing that's being named and the things around it. They promote understanding. You know. If I named my variables or my classes Marshall, John, and Bob, how the hell would I know what they do? You know, John might be the boss uh, uh, class, but uh, you know, that's a very poorly chosen name. So I think names are really important. Now, 
In Jacksonville, in the discussion of merging the ranges TS into the IS in LEWG, and I was sitting in the room, there was mild consensus, not quite strong consensus, that we're not going to be putting things into STUD2. So it's not officially dead, and that was a straw poll in the room, but there was some consensus that we're not going to use STUD2. Uh, there were people who raised some very valid objections, and ultimately the room was convinced by those. So any design for new containers is going to need to pick names in STUD that are non-conflicting with existing names. Fortunately, given the quality of the names in STUD, that shouldn't be much of a problem. <laughs> so let's talk about concrete containers. What concrete containers should be provided. And here I'm thinking about the things you learn about in Sedgwick or Corman or Weiss, the classical containers or Nuth, right? I think we should have a multi-dimensional dynamic array. I don't need a 2D array of strings very often, but when I do, I don't want to do vector of vector of string. I would just like to have array bracket string comma two and have it work. For purposes of optimization, I think it should also have a partial specialization for the one-dimensional case. You know, trying to define a general set of iterators for multidimensional arrays is a tough problem, but they make perfect sense for the one-dimensional case. Likewise, I think we should have a multidimensional fixed size array, again with a partial specialization for the one-dimensional or linear case. That's not a very <laughs> difficult thing to do. I think. I was never clear where the word deck came from. Is it double-ended Q? Yes. You know, I, I've also read that it's, it's a play on the term, uh, if you think about how decks are implemented, deck of cards, right? Each card is like a, a page, right? It's a deck of cards. I don't like that name. I don't like it because I look at it and say, this is a double-ended double Q. That's an abstract data type. I could implement a double-ended Q with a double-ended dynamic array or a doubly linked list. Right? Singly linked list. Not forward list, singly linked list. Doubly linked list, not list, doubly linked list. These are the names that the classic data structures are given. Why can't we use them? Binary tree. Sometimes I want a binary tree. I want to manipulate the binary tree. I don't need it to be ordered, you know. I want it to be a tree because I'm representing something in a tree and maybe ordering is not important. I would like to have that. Binary search tree. Okay, sometimes I would like to have uh, a tree that I can search elements in, but I don't, wanna, I don't wanna have some other thing telling me how to order it. So, a binary search tree. Red-black tree. I would like to have a separate red-black tree and I would like to have a separate AVL tree. Uh, AVL trees, in general, have, can have slightly better balancing than the degenerate case for red-black trees, whereas red-black trees are, have slightly better performance for insertions and deletions. I'd like to have the option to use one or the other. You know, AVL trees have been around for 40 years or more. Um, they have this reputation as being hard to implement, but people have done it. Why can't we do it? Radix trees. About five years ago, there was a really good paper, and I can't think of the author's name right now, on a data structure called the, the Adaptive Radix Tree. And it's, uh, well, it's a Radix tree. Uh, I used it, I implemented in C++, and I used it as a tri, you know, T-R-I-E. Uh, and it has some amazing properties for search speed and would be an ideal container from which to make uh, a map. Uh, uh, it, it's really very cool. Well, the radix tree idea is very cool in general, but lookups are order one, right? You, you walk down the characters in your string, you traverse the nodes of the tree as you encounter each character, and you either hit something or you don't. You don't actually, you're not actually comparing strings. And uh, the interesting, uh, in the paper, he gives some very compelling performance numbers against hash tables and other uh, B-tree implementations. Uh, he's, he's published in the context of database indices, but I recommend, if you're interested in these kind of things, adaptive radix tree. Um, you know, radix trees also have the interesting property that 
at least in the application of strings, uh, that uh, you can use them to do sorts that are linear time. To do the sort, you have your set of strings, you insert them into the radix tree, then you do an in-order traversal of the radix tree to pull them out. So you've done one pass in and one pass out. Radix trees have the property that the shape of the tree is the same no matter the order that you enter the elements. So at some point, you might have enough strings that it makes, and enough memory that it makes sense to employ a radix tree to do linear time string sorting. I've not done that myself, but I've often thought, hey, that's a cool idea, it might work. Chained hash table, we have classic chained hash table implementation. Linearly probed hash tables, a slightly older version of hash tables. Graphs, I'm not sure about this. Boost has its adjacency list and adjacency uh, matrix concrete graph implementations. I'm not quite sure they make sense to be part of the concrete containers in the standard, so I've got a question mark there. Matrix. I would like to have a mathematical type matrix, which is distinct from a 2D array, which has uh, operations and syntax that say, I'm working in the mathematical domain and I'm not going to mix names by, you know, with this poorly named vector thing. And along the same lines, I th would be nice if the, the library had row vector and column vector. You know, if you're doing linear algebra, there are two kinds of vectors, row vectors and column vectors. They're not vectors, row and column vectors. Uh, Guy Davidson and I are, are going to work on a proposal to extract some of the uh, contents of the, uh, the graphics proposal and turn it into a linear algebra proposal for the library. Vittorio. So the question is, how far are Guy and I intending to go with the idea? Uh, are we intending to go as far as the Eigen library, which has expression templates and is a very complex piece of software? Uh, you know, Vittorio, we've not actually started yet. I think the idea would be to create some uh, simple, simpler components that one could use to implement something like the 2D graphics library, but not to the extent that things like uh, that I can do. Yes? In that case, aren't you contradicting yourself with your desire of supporting our users and expert users? That's a good point. And uh, I'm going to turn off the requirement for self-consistency while I'm up here. <laughs> uh, so the question was, am I contradicting myself in, in not supporting power users? And the response is, I'm going to contradict myself. Related question, if I could? Yes, John. When I first applied at Bear Stearns, uh, they asked me a question about would I create a matrix type? And if so, would I overload the operators? And that was their trick question. They were C programmers, they were super high-end performance, and they <coughs> knew that if I overloaded the multiplication operation on a matrix, that I was going to shoot myself in the foot because it depends on the matrix data. Okay. Like sparse or whatever. How would you address that? I don't have an answer for that question. The answer is, how would I address operator overloading and getting the most performance out of it? I don't know. You know, I'm, Guy and I are at the very beginning of this journey. We've not actually written anything or started any work yet. But it's a valid question. So there's, a, there's an answer. The answer is don't overload operators, but instead have named functions that address particular characterizations of the data in a utility type. Yes, so the comment is not to overload operators, but to use named functions that are specialized for the purpose to get the highest performance, right? Correct. Is that a fair characterization? That's totally fair. Okay. Moving on, what abstract container adapter should be provided by this library? Well, stack, we've got that already. Uh, and I think the existing stack might actually work with uh, uh, my design. Q, we know what a Q is, a double-ended Q. Uh, not deck, but double-ended queue, a binary heap, and by this I mean the traditional binary heap data structure that is, that is called priority queue in the standard now, Fibonacci heaps, eh, I'm kind of iffy on this, but they can give much better performance uh, than, uh, than binary heaps, ordered set, ordered multiset. Notice the name ordered. Ordered tells me something about what it is. 
ordered map, ordered multi-map. Again, ordered, the adjective, tells me something about what this thing is, what, what I can expect it to be. Hashed set, hashed multi-set, hashed map, hashed multi-map. I think hashed is a better adjective and describes to me better what these things need and what they do and what I need to provide for them to work correctly. Question. Yes, John. At the last minute, we changed from hashed set and hashed map to unordered. And while it was hashed set, we didn't have a quality comparison operator. And there was a big fight because everybody in the standard thought of a hash of an unordered map as a hash map. And yet they wanted to have the order of the iteration matter in terms of a quality comparison. <coughs> and it was only when somebody kind of hit their head and said, wait, it says unordered map. How could it possibly matter what the order of iteration is? That it finally was adopted. Okay. So, but when it was hash map, there was there was no problem with it. Do you see what I'm saying? Yes. So, okay. so the comment is in committee meetings when they were discussing the names unordered versus hashed map, that um, I'm going to I'm going to fail at this it's characterization. The comparison that was, with was confusing because they kept thinking it was named hash map, but it was named unordered map. And who in their right mind would think that order would matter in an unordered map? That was the point. But they didn't hear unordered map, they heard hash map. Okay. So the other thing is, is that the unordered map is, is just complete with all of these hash function accessors and things that wouldn't belong to an unordered map because it's an unordered map. It didn't say it was hash. Okay. Okay. Uh, I'm not sure I can summarize that fairly, so I'm going to let it go. Uh, but in order to not conflict with existing names, uh, at least in my proposal, I've chosen these names. And here I have graph as a question mark again because I'm not sure whether graph could be implemented as an abstract adapter over some existing concrete containers or not. So that's why it appears in both places with a question mark. Marshall. So um, as long as we're talking about names, um, the world has moved on since the word map means something different now. Okay. Google has popularized map and reduce. Okay. Um, what these are, these are now known in many other languages as dictionaries. Ordered dictionary, hashed dictionary, what do you call the non-unique versions of those? I don't know. Okay. But I like, I like the dictionary idea. So the comment is that other languages use the term dictionary instead of map. Right. And yes. Map is, map is in fact an algorithm. Map is also known as an algorithm in MapReduce, yes. Dictionary, I like that idea. I hope I can remember it. Yes, sir. Dictionary implies order, though, does it not? No, dictionary implies lookup. Dictionary, in my mind, implies lookup. The comment was dictionary implies ordered, and I think, at least in my mind, dictionary just implies uh, lookup. Right, but I mean, if it's not ordered, lookup is practically impossible. You open up a dictionary, you want to look up word starts with a Z, you know, you know you're going to have to go to the back of the dictionary. You're going to skip over everything else. You, it's not going to be in the middle of the dictionary. Okay, okay, so the, the point is that looking up in a dictionary could be, the, I think what you're getting to is some sort of lexicographical lookup where you're searching, and the searching is done an element of time or some portion of the key at a time, and you're you're requiring you're relying on that lexicographical ordering to get you to the to the value associated with that key. Correct. Is that a fair characterization? Yes. Okay. All right. Well, I don't want to quibble about this because I would like to get on to the other stuff. All right. So I'm going to take some inspiration from Lisa's talk, and I want to talk about shape. And shape, I think, is a fundamental property of containers. Containers have a shape. Uh, and I'm not a mathematician. I can't describe a shape in, in topological terms. I'm sure there are a lot of people, including Lisa, that, that could. But the nature of that shape is a fundamental property of that container's type. Um, you know, a binary tree, it has a shape to it. And that shapeness, that, that quality of that shape, is that's what describes that container. And the shape for a binary tree, for example, uh, at least a, 
uh, a non-degenerate binary tree, is different than that, say, of a linked list. They are two different shapes, and that concept, that abstract concept of shape is what defines the containers. So, in, in implementation, the, the, the shape is described, in a sense, by the source code. Um, in a way, this is stretching, this is not the greatest analogy, the, the abstract shape of a container is kind of like a template. And we give a container guidance in how to form its shape at runtime by giving it some template arguments. You know, we have, uh, uh, we have set. So we tell it, okay, you know, you kind of have this basic idea how you're going to build yourself, but here's some more detail about how to do that because I want you to use less when you order your keys, or I want you to use uh, greater, right? You still get the same shape, but the, you know, I, I've given it uh, different marching orders in how to do it. The container's runtime shape also depends on the values of its elements. You know, uh, uh, can depend on the value of its elements, like the, the uh, red black tree and AVL tree, their shape will change depending on the value of its elements. Uh, the order of insertion, well, obviously, uh, the shape of a, of a linked list depends on the order of insertion, and the shape of red-black trees can depend on the order of insertion. You can insert keys in a degenerate way and, and get the tree to its most, most unbalanced form. Uh, or can depend on both, right? So, here's a, a key point which ties into my concepts and talks from the fancy pointer, the implementation and management of a container's <laughs> runtime shape is accomplished also by using the addressing model. And if you've been to my talks on allocators or, or fancy pointers, you'll know that the addressing model is this idea I have of something that, that implements bits that are used to represent an address in memory. Uh, the addressing model describes how an address is computed from those bits. And the addressing model also describes how memory from some fundamental memory resource, which I call the storage model, is arranged. So the canonical example of uh, an addressing model is a void star, right? A natural pointer. It has bits that represent an address. Uh, the compiler and the processor know how to use those bits to compute an address. And finally, a void star has perhaps the simplest uh, description of the layout of memory from a fundamental memory resource, which is, you know, uh, the CPU. So, just to reuse a couple of pictures, uh, here's an example of a two-dimensional addressing model, where I may have some segments that I've allocated from, you know, S-break or virtual alloc, and my, my pointer, my addressing model, is a segment ID plus an offset into the segment. So I've created an artificial or synthetic pointer. Or offset addressing, where my pointers consist uh, of an offset to the thing that's being pointed to. Uh, if you could, can't really see, maybe from the back, but each of those three pointers uh, have different internal set of bits, but they represent the same address. Uh, the thing that they're pointing to is described by how far they are away from the pointer that's pointing to that thing. So, I think the addressing model is very important uh, because it's a fundamental property, as I see it, that's as critical to a container's operation at runtime as is its source code and its template arguments. It's, it's the thing that the source code guided by the template arguments, used to stick bits into memory and do stuff with them. So, again, just a quick summary. The runtime shape of a container depends on its source code, which sort of describes a platonic ideal. The template arguments, which tell it how do you get to that ideal, or how do you try to instantiate that ideal. The addressing model that provides access to memory so the instance can be built, right? That's the, the gateway through ideas flow into memory. And the data, which is laid out into memory accordance with all of the above. Thinking in these terms, the addressing model is a fundamental property of a container. And just to hammer the point home, a traditional STL allocator is not. So let's look at a possible idiom. And this is the design sketch that I mentioned earlier. 
what I like to do, try, what I've tried to do is factor containers into levels. And for lack of a better term, the first level, the lowest level, is level zero, an engine type. And given my pet peeve about naming, I guess I should admit shamefully that my names are not that good here. Uh, level zero is an engine type that performs manipulations that depend only on the addressing model. It can be aware of the type, but the manipulations of things that contain that type depend only on the addressing model, and I'm going to give an example of that. Level one is an engine type that is slightly higher, an engine type that employs the corresponding level zero engine, but performs additional work that depends on the source of memory, the allocator type or the heap type. In the rest of the examples, I'm going to use the term heap to mean allocator so as to avoid confusion with stood allocator. I see two variants, partial specializations might be way, one way of implementing them. One for stateless heaps and one for stateful heaps. Level two is a fully featured container similar to the containers we think of today with similar customizability, but internally expressed with level with the level zero or with a level one engine which employs a, a level zero engine. And finally, level three. Basic is not the best word, but a basic container whose type signature doesn't contain the allocator in which uses the global heap. Uh, so in the examples, I'm going to introduce a new nested namespace for level zero, excuse me, level zero, one, and two. Uh, and level three goes in stood. Okay, some source code, enough hand waving. Imagine, if you will, and I'm I'm using structs, and these are sketches. These are not fully formed classes. The code here will actually compile, but it does nothing. Uh, these are sketches of how these concepts, could, concepts or ideas could fit together. So let's talk about a global stateless heap. Uh, so this is, in a sense, analogous to std allocator, which is stateless. Uh, it propagates on move assignment and Instances of, of std allocator always compare equal. Well, instances of the st global stateless heap also always compare equal because they're stateless. There's only one, it's a singleton. Importantly, its addressing model is expressed in the nested type def void pointer, and its addressing model is actually a void star. And we've got a couple of member functions for allocating and deallocating memory. Uh, I've never understood why allocators needed to be parametrized in the first place. I can use a member function template to do exactly the same thing, and therefore my, my, my class type doesn't need to be a template. And uh, as a small point of optimization and another pet peeve of mine that I've never been able to get this before, not only am I going to return a void pointer, but I'm also going to tell you how many bytes I actually allocated, because you might have some use for that information, right? Uh, notice that my return type in my tuple and also my deallocation is in terms of my addressing model, right? And this will work with synthetic pointers. It doesn't have to be void star. Uh, let's imagine another thing analogous to a PMR allocator. And here I'm, I'm calling these things heap to distinguish them from the standard resources. A point, it's got a pointer to a, stand, uh, to a, to a PMR memory resource, and it follows uh, the same conventions, right? Except it has the uh, is always equal false, which is the same as the PMR allocator, but its, uh, its uh, addressing model is also a void star. And the allocate and deallocate interface is otherwise identical. The reason for this will become apparent in a couple of slides. All right, now let's get into the nuts and bolts. Here is a level zero container, my doubly linked list engine, right? It's parameterized in terms of my element type and my addressing model, which I'm calling VP here for void pointer. So I'm going to, I'm going to declare a list node and a data node, uh, the value type. I'm going to use std pointer traits to, and the rebinder in std pointer traits to figure out what is the analogous pointer type for my list node and my data node. 
Then I'm going to define my list node, which just contains my previous and next pointers, and then my data node, which is actually the nodes that are going to hold data, which are derived from my list node and actually have the data in them. I'm doing that because I want to put a sentinel node in my engine to act as for, to, you know, for, for sensing when the list is empty or also to be uh, my, uh, my sentinel, my end. And I've included uh, some functions here, so a, a sampling of functions, which can do their operation without, can, can, can do their work without needing to know anything about the allocator. These guys only need to know about the nodes that they hold. Allocation is unimportant to them performing their mission. So let's move up a level to level one. SLH, this is the stateless heap doubly linked list engine. Uh, in this example, I've publicly derived it from the, from the level zero doubly linked list engine. Uh, you'll note that this is parameterized in terms of a heap and heap, the heaps contain uh, as part of their interface the description of the addressing model. So that's the sec second template parameter. And what I've done here is have a couple of functions which actually do have to work in terms of the allocator. Clear needs to use the services of the allocator to deallocate nodes once the elements of the node inside the node have been destroyed. Pushback, in, in this silly simple conception, uh, calls make node t, make node call, uh, you know, uh, allocates the node and copy constructs the data into it, and then calls the version of pushback here, uh, which took an, a data node pointer. He doesn't need to know anything about the allocator to, to stick him into the list. So, pardon me? Oh, do I? These are all pushback. The previous slide is all pushback. Ah. Somebody must have broken into my laptop and done that when I wasn't looking. Okay, but you get the idea here? Now, the important thing here, stateless heap. It uses heap colon colon allocate. Well, its cousin is state full heap, SFH, which is basically the same thing, and the only difference is, okay, now I'm, I'm going to contain an object of a heap, uh, and a heap or an allocator is a handle to a memory resource. If, if Arthur's in the room somewhere, I had to get that plug in. Oh, there he is. Had to get that plug in. It's a handle to a memory resource. But the important difference here is it uses the, the member object to do its allocation with. So I've got allocator independent operations and allocator dependent operations in level zero and level one, respectively. Okay, still in this new namespace, XCI, which I should have mentioned before is Extended Container Interface. Uh, here's my power user doubly linked list. And it's parameterized in terms of the element type and the heap. And notice here, my default heap type is the polymorphic heap. And I'll explain why I made that choice in a couple of slides. But the first thing I need to do is I need to pick an engine type. Right? I need to store my list engine because that's the thing that's going to hold my elements. So how do I pick my engine type? Well, what I want to do is somehow determine is my heap type stateful or stateless and determining on, uh, depending on the answer, I want to pick the right engine from level one. So that's what conditional T is doing there for me. Once I've got that information here in my engine, uh, then I can create wrapper functions that do their work in terms of the engine. Does that make sense? Uh, it's very straightforward. Now, let's look in namespace std. Here I've got a class, doubly linked list, but it's only parameterized in terms of t. And here I'm going to, by fiat, declare that my engine type, I'm going to use my nested, my, uh, or I'm going to use my stateless heap doubly linked list engine, and it's going to be parameterized in terms of my element type t, but I'm going to use the global stateless heap, the first class that I showed you. In other words, this class is going to go out and get stuff that somewhere down the line has been created by global operator new, or operator, you know, global operator new, and uh, create the corresponding engine type and work just the same as the XCI version of the list does. Let's suppose I want to create a custom heap. 
and this is in the global namespace. So I'm going to follow the same pattern. I'm going to decide, you know, I haven't shown the POC, POCMA traits up here or the POX traits up here, but I could very well imagine having them and either using a standard allocator traits or maybe a new stood heat traits or something to do the same thing that stood allocator traits does. But I'm going to create the same sort of interface. And now I've got some function here and I'm going to create three different kinds of lists. My simple doubly linked list, which uses the global stateless heap. My power user doubly linked list, where I've only specified the element type, which by default uses polymorphic heap, and brings with it in that class all of the things that you would need to do today if you wanted to use one of the objects that exist in PMR. And finally, I'm going to do something really fancy with my custom heap. So with, with this uh, template parameter or argument, I'm actually going to use it. And uh, here's just, you know, calling some of those member functions. Does that make sense? Okay. Question? Yes. Uh, is there a reason you um, basically chose different um, heap types as the default for a doubly linked list and for the XCI doubly linked list? Yes. I find it confusing in a way because either I would omit the default altogether in the XCI doubly linked list, so I always have to explicitly say which one I want. Yes. Or so the, the same default. So the question is, why did I choose different default behavior between the std linked list and the std XCI linked list? And um, I could have chosen the same default, but the std XCI linked list, in, in my conception, is designed for the power user or above. And the power user is probably going to be interested in doing some optimization with allocators. And they would probably be interested in benefiting from uh, all, of the, all of the good things that the PMR and memory resource model brings. And that's why I chose that default. That might not be the right decision, but that's the thinking that I had when I chose that default. If someone is gonna, if someone's gonna do this, they're probably interested in optimizing the allocator. That's the first thing they're gonna try to optimize. And they're, you know, they're gonna be looking for the kind of optimizations and the performance benefits that John has talked about and, and displayed at, at this conference last year. And that's why I chose that. It, you know, th that's the reasoning behind that decision. There's an important point, which is vocabulary. And if you, have, if you don't specify the allocator type, every time you have a different allocator, you have a different C++ type. And yes. So the idea is the whole point of polymorphic allocators is you don't change the type of the class because you use a different allocator. That's critical. Yes. So John's comment is the whole point, uh, uh, the big feature that polymorphic allocators bring to the table is that a container type that's parameterized in terms of the polymorphic allocator has the same compile time type as every other container, except they might be using a different memory resource behind the scenes at runtime, right? That's, a, that's an important benefit, and thank you for, for mentioning that. And you would get that benefit here, right, in this model. Now, this is for the power user that wants, like, you know, me fooling around with self-contained DOMs that really wants to, to, to tailor things. And I think in this model, I can sort of have my cake and eat it too. Okay, so thinking about, you know, what, what would this, could this possibly look like for some of the other containers? You know, I gave a long laundry list of containers that I would like to see. You know, you know I've just, I've created some, uh, some template, you know, forward declarations here in an effort to experiment with, you know, what, what would this look like? So in my XCI namespace, you know, here are some possible interfaces for that. Uh, you know, you've already seen doubly linked list. I mentioned dynamic array. Uh, so I've got dynamic array there and I'm not sure that's legal C++, but you get the idea, the, the partial specialization for the one-dimensional case. And then finally, something that is sort of intended to evoke what, what we're doing now uh, uh, with, uh, uh, with sets, except with red-black tree. And then finally, sort of analogous declarations, forward declarations that would occur in namespace stood. Yes? This one? So for, for when you write functions that consume one of these types, because these are basic vocabulary types, uh, today we write something like 
list allocator, list of type and allocator, or yes. vector of type and allocator. And that <coughs> all these cases that we don't at at uh, at client library code we don't care about which list they're using. The user is going to use. Uh, how would that work? Would you have to provide separate overloads for <coughs> the the basic type versus the power user type for every one of those that consumes the list? So the question is the the I've got two different names here, the power user list and the simplified list. And the question is, would a library need to provide overloads for those two different things? And I guess the answer is yes, it would. Because these are actually two different types. They are not, they're not, you know, one is not a type def of the other. They are two distinct different types. So that could be an unfortunate uh, uh, downside to this model. Yes, Vittorio. I'm assuming the question applies when you cannot use iterators to consume it, because otherwise you can use iterators. Mm -hmm. And now that we have concepts, the library must uh, should just be able to provide a cancel function constrained on the concept of a doubly linked list, which will work with any level of doubly linked list. <coughs> so the comment is now that we have we have or will soon have concepts that a library should be able to constrain on the concept of doubly linked list, and that these types could express that concept. Is that a fair? Yeah. Okay. And the first half of it was, uh, if you're just trapped with any iterators, you're bolded anyway. Yes, and Marshall makes the point that if you are just trafficking in iterators, or Marshall's reiterating, reiterating Vittorio's point, if you are just trafficking in iterators, it's not a concern, right? Okay, let's see, we looked at this. All right, so some possible benefits from this model. Uh, the, as you saw, the stood and stood XCI containers of a given shape or type, so to speak, and that's probably not a well-written sentence, containers of a given shape are actually different C++ types. Uh, the XCI version builds upon the stood version interface without actually using inheritance. Uh, and of course it does this to support container customization at least in this conception, around allocation. But uh, because they are different types, and we do have sort of the expert-friendly type, we might be able to find other instances of behavior or, or uh, services that the expert, the expert level types could provide that don't exist in the basic type. Uh, I'm kind of tired, so I can't think of an example of that off the top of my head, but Having two different types, uh, you know, sort of basic and expert level does, uh, you know, they should both express a common set uh, of, functional, uh, of functionality, but the expert type could provide more, and that more doesn't necessarily need to be around memory allocation. There could be other things, other possible customization points and things for tuning that you could add to the expert level that you don't put in the, the basic interface because those people don't need it or care about it. Yes. There is the choice of between two types, one simple, one expert, where the expert is everything the simple one was, and then some more. Yes. And one type where it's both, but if you ignore the expert part, you have the simple type. Yes. And that's even better because then you don't have the dichotomy of two different types representing <coughs> the same basic idea. So the comment is, given, given the a design choice between two different types like I have now where you have a simple type and you have an expert type that expresses everything in the simple type plus more or the alternative choice of a single type which has all of the interface and you get the simple part of the interface by ignoring the expert level interface John contends that the latter is a better design decision than the former you know there's a lot of there's a lot of merit to that point I don't not sure that I agree, but it's a, it's a very valid point. Did, did I express it well enough? Yeah, the, yes, you did. And the reason is, is that if you have two separate types that basically represent the same ethereal concept or value, mm -hmm. then you have an interoperability problem because now the only way to consume both of them is through templates as opposed to non-templated functions and therein be dragging. But 
on the other side of the coin, the reason for having two different types was to avoid the template type pollution in the basic type where it's not needed. Well, I'm totally in favor of that. And again, what I'm saying is, for example, with polymorphic memory resource, if you don't care about allocators, just pretend they don't exist. Right. But if you do care about them, they must be in the interface, otherwise you can't use the type. And if you have that capability, the two, the two <coughs> user groups are interoperable. And I say that with an asterisk, move semantics for the simple users will interfere with the high performance need my local memory pool users. Okay, so the comment is that, oh, I'm gonna have a hard time <laughs> with this. Um, the comment is, is that, for example, in the case of polymorphic allocators, uh, if you don't need to have, uh, if you don't need to mess with the allocators in that portion of the interface, you can pretend it doesn't exist and still use the container anyway, yes. right? Okay. And with no, with no extra complexity. With no extra complexity. Right. Okay. Other than documentation. Uh, another comment, other than documentation, perhaps. Uh, Another possible benefit, at least in this, in this sketch, is that the layered engine approach provides for, I'm going to flatter myself and call it wise code reuse. may not be wise, but it is one way of, of, of writing less source code to do more things. So I think of it, uh, let me just go back a second. Three levels of customization for three categories of user. And to my way, my initial way of thinking and in this sketch, I think each level provides sort of the right amount of complexity for each category of user uh, in my conception of this. <coughs> and that's the slides. Is there, can I answer more questions? Vittorio. Are you, are you exposing the engines? No. no you're not the question is, am I exposing the engines I did not indicate there uh, because I didn't want to clutter up the slides, but the engines are private implementation details. Yes? I just want to go back to the gentleman's comment earlier before about <coughs> the default parameterization of your types. Okay. One in stood, one in XCI. Th being different between the being two namespaces. Between, exactly. Um, just looking at that one pivotal slide that you had with, with the three instantiations. The function F1 that I had? Other than the namespace difference, there is no other signature difference <coughs> of that. And so... You would expect the behavior to be the same. Exactly. And so going with your uh, basic user, um, expert user, and, and uh, power user, I'd like to see the signatures be a little bit more different than just namespace. So, so the comment is that the different behavior, because the template signatures were different, between the, the, the basic version of the container and the default template uh, behavior of the XCI version of the container is causing cognitive dissonance. And the suggestion is that they should both default to the same uh, heap because they have the same, uh, they, they have basically the same source code except for the namespace difference. And that violates the principle of least surprise and one behaves differently than the other. Okay, that's a very valid point, and you have convinced me. See, that's how flexible I am. Uh, yes, John. You said that you're not exposing the underlying engine. It seems to me that there's tremendous value in the factoring that you've suggested, where we have the different levels of need to use, and say everything, no matter how interesting it up here, it is up here, still uses the basic same strategy. And that, that actually I find to be a very effective implementation tool at the same time, once the engine does exactly what you expect it to do, mm -hmm. it too forms a reusable piece. And if you have a system that's open, somebody can come along and say, I, I really like your hash table almost. We use the underlying parts and we assemble a hash table right next to it that has 90% reused parts and 10% what they need. And that is the essence of hierarchical reuse. And I see no reason to hide your engine. So, so John's comment is that uh, he believes that the engine types and the hierarchical engine types should actually be exposed uh, to the user because they might actually want to reuse them and customize them in their own way. <coughs> and uh, something at a higher level. 
level in their customize way. something at a higher level in their own way. And uh, I find myself in agreement. So my original conception is that they would actually be private and not part of the public interface, but I think you make a compelling point. Are they stable? The underlying pieces, are they stable? Well, they would have to be. If they're stable, they should not be private. So John makes the comment that if the underlying components are stable, there's no reason to keep them private and they should be publicly exposed. Because they add value. Because they add value. Okay. Any other questions? All right. Well, thank you very much for coming. I appreciate your attention.